All right, welcome back to the Atlanta Child Murders Revisited. This is video number 44. I'm going to call this one A Bridge Too Far. So we're going to continue with the Atlanta Monster uh, interview and about Wayne Williams' encounter with the police at the bridge and how it varies over the years and depends on who he's talking to. Uh, but first, I wanted to give a preview of a new section I'm going to add. So this will be four sections of just old videos and movies about the Atlanta child murders, mostly news media archives and stuff like that. Now, this one is from Foggy Melson. He's got a great selection of uh, old news video and stuff that he's posted on his website. Great stuff. I like this one because it kind of talks about what we're talking about and also shows you a side of Wayne Williams, too. And so... What I'm going to do is just spend, you know, my third video. I'll I'll do FBI documents like I'm doing here, and then we'll do personalities like Homer, and uh, then we're going to do archive news footage and go over that. Really good stuff. But anyway, let's take a look at this real quick, and we'll get back into that monster uh, podcast. It was the pre-dawn hours of May 22nd. The Atlanta Police Bureau and the FBI had been staking out bridges. Now, just stopping right there, you see how that railing is not very high. See, that's, what, about six inches on the step? And then you're probably looking at two feet. So if you do the fireman's carry, throw the body over your right shoulder, step up. This is your waist right here, right about waist height, maybe even below your waist. This it's no big deal to just throw the body right over this railing. I don't know why all these other attorneys try to make it, or defenders of Wayne Williams try to make it like it's a big feat. It's not. All right, let's keep going. ...along the Chattahoochee River for the last two months. That morning, while four officers sat quietly under the South Cobb Drive Bridge, one of them, an Atlanta recruit, heard a splash. That's not Several the South radio Coop. messages and a flurry of activity soon had a car stopped. In it was 23-year-old Wayne Williams. No arrest was made then, and no one inspected two bags of clothes, the pair of men's shoes. And they got that wrong because he's not 23 at that time. He's actually, what, about 20, 22? Let's see, 1981 minus 1958. Yeah. So, it's the 22nd. His birthday's not till the 27th. Um, so, he's actually 22. They got that part wrong. ...or the glove seen inside the station wagon. For two days, the task force quietly dragged the river, not finding anything. Three days later, two people in a canoe did. The nude body of Nathaniel Cater a mile downstream from the South Cobb Bridge. For the next two weeks, Wayne Williams was being watched. Police thought the surveillance was undercover. Uh, William says, yeah. not so. And they put a tail on me uh, starting last week. I made them probably in the first hour or two. And uh, in the process of tailing me, I, uh, a couple of the guys apparently weren't very good drivers, and I caused them to have a minor accident. And I think they were just pissed. By June 3rd, task force leaders decided their surveillance had in fact been spotted. That night, they entered his home with a search warrant, confiscating bags of alleged evidence. Across town at the state crime lab, experts claimed that fibers taken from a carpet and bedspread that night matched fibers taken from the victim's head. Dog hairs taken from the family pet also matched animal hairs taken from the body. But after 12 hours of intense questioning, Wayne Williams was not arrested. We have not, nor do we intend to make an arrest. We have, as we do on many occasions, follow-up and investigative leads to determine so let's go into that. So here's the thing. According to the Constitution, you have the right to demand the government give you a speedy trial. Okay. So once they arrest him, the clock's on. The investigation has to hurry up. They basically have to go with whatever they have. Okay. And then they can ask a judge to delay it but there's no guarantee that a judge would delay it. So not arresting him immediately, they're still investigating, trying to strengthen their case. 
at this time, they're trying to figure out how they're going to get him on all 30 or 28 or whatever they decided the total is at that time of the murders. And they're looking at it from the broad picture saying, you know, and the DA is saying, hey, there's not enough here. And he's not sure about the fiber evidence. This is one of the first trials using fiber evidence like that. So he wasn't sure how that was going to be perceived by a jury, okay? And, uh, I mean, you're basically wading into the darkness hoping that uh, science won't bore these, the juror to death. So that's why they waited. Determine exactly where those leads ultimately takes us in terms of our efforts tonight. We have not ended up with the information that would result in an arrest. What followed was three more weeks outside the Williams home. The media watched what was later called police presence, which was watching the non-suspect around the clock. Yeah, look at that. Finally, on Father's Day, a month after the bridge incident, Wayne Williams was arrested and charged with the murder of Nathaniel Cater. Now, I don't know if you've been following this, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, Giglio, Giglio Beach, or whatever it is in Long Island. Um, very similar things going on here. You got a guy, although this guy is like 59 or something like that, from, I, from what I read. Um... These murders actually occurred like 2010, like over 10 years ago. Um, but they covertly surveilled him. Now, and what I read, how they found him was he was calling up these prostitutes. Well, one of the prostitutes had a, a gigolo, I guess you could say. some A manager, I guess you could say. And uh, I guess... It, they would drive them out to the location and then come back and pick them up later. Stuff like that. So what happened, from what I read, is that the uh, one of the gigolos, after the girl was killed, remembers a car that was in the area that where he dropped her off. Now, I don't know where. I mean, how was he meeting these? Is there a separate? I, I haven't read anywhere. I've just skimmed through the the news on this, but I it, it, did he was he meeting him at a motel or something? Uh, that seems like that'd be pretty easy to to track. So I don't know how he was meeting these women, and then you know, surely it wasn't some parking lot somewhere. But uh, apparently he was calling them off Craigslist or something, and then but anyway, the gigolo gave a description to the police of the man and the car. And they identified him that way. And then they surveilled him for like a year uh, or maybe six months or something like that. They got some DNA from his this pizza box. You know, you lift up by the trash. And they got his DNA from that, and it matched up. They had been surveilling him, and then what, about two weeks ago, two weeks before the arrest, he had an encounter at a park with another girl, scared this girl to death. And that's when they decided to move in. The... He'd also had, they had him, uh, been tracing him using a burner phone, contacting other prostitutes or whatever on Craigslist, not killing them. But when they searched his computer and his Google searches, they found out that he was intensely Googling about the murders. Even though it had been like 10 years, he was still following it. And, uh, and there's another instance where a girl went on a date with him, I don't know, five, ten years ago, and he was constantly talking about these murders with her at this first date. Kind of weird. Uh, but then again, that's just somebody saying something. You don't know if that's really real. But uh, anyway, so it's almost exactly like the Wayne Williams case. The guy had a double life. And, uh, and it's sort of like the Green Killer one where the Green Killer was killing prostitutes because he figured no one would miss them. And then he was following the media just like the, the FBI profile did about Wayne Williams, that he would be following the media. And again, when Wayne Williams is stopped, we're going to read in the FBI reports, he says that uh, 
he didn't think he told the FBI agent he didn't think the media was covering the uh, the cases enough or something like that. But the reason I want to go over the the videos is because you can see for yourself where Wayne Williams is getting his anger from. Because there's an incidence where his father keeps coming out and just going after the media on the street, you know, and the thing he's Apparently, maybe he doesn't understand or doesn't appreciate because he's a journalist also. He's out there taking pictures and stuff like that and selling that. Apparently, he has one rule for himself and one rule for everyone else that he can go to the funerals. He can go up on stage uh, at a fundraiser and get chastised by Frank Sinatra and take pictures and uh, things like that. But the media can't practice his constitutional right and stand out in the street and take pictures of him coming and going. So it seems to be one rule for him and Wayne Williams and another set of rules for the media. Okay, And I'm sure, you know, the media is not stupid. They have a legal team, a legal department with attorneys, and they're all, you know, and I'm sure they're bantering about with the police and the mayor and you know, and stuff like that, and they all know their rights, you know, and that's the thing. With the media, you can't let the government or let individuals tell you what to do and stomp on your constitutional rights. You have to push back, okay, because once you give an inch, they're going to take a mile, and before you know it, you're not going to have any rights as a, as the media, whether we like it or not. Whether we like the coverage or not, the media has a constitutional right to practice his profession in public just like everybody else. But anyway, we just saw, he will rewind that real quick. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that photo right there. That made the Atlanta Journal Constitution <laughs> headlines. Front page. I mean, you're trying to say you're a nice guy, and I'm also gonna. We're gonna go over another video of this that Wayne Williams, when he was a teenager and just a year before, neighbors knew he was gay. You know, they all knew he was gay. He Wayne Williams would dress up in women's clothing, his mother's clothing, and walk around the neighborhood. Okay. So to sit there and deny that you're homosexual and then in the the vehicle he's got dresses and women's clothing and high heels in a bag. And then he's got another bag with his gym shorts. So that kind of tells you something there. Yeah, I remember that that picture right there made the news headlines. But anyway, keep going. Finally on Father's Day, a month after the bridge incident, Wayne Williams was arrested and charged with the murder of Nathaniel Cater. But yeah, Foggy Nelson, Nelson, he's got a lot of good stuff, and um, I really like his stuff. And then another guy, Hezekiah, he's got some really good stuff too. All right, so back to the monster video. About 46 years. And All right, we'll go back to that. Hold on one second.
All right, let me do this again. So Cheryl Johnson's address is 2300 Benson Pool Road, Marietta, Georgia. Okay, and that is approximately right there. And I know this area very, very well because in 1985, 86, 87, I was working over here. I had an apartment off of Windy Hills Road and Highway 41 right here. My girlfriend lived off of Spring Road. We used to go to Cumberland Mall and go to movies and go to dates. And we would go up and down South Cobb Drive. There was, used to be a movie theater over here also. Go to eat over here. She went to high school at Campbell High School right there. Okay. And it's a very short distance going down Windy Hill from 75 over to where Cheryl Johnson's apartment is at. I don't remember ever going over that area. I'm sure I was in that area. But my question is, if Cheryl Johnson's apartment's over here, this is South Cobb Drive. It's a long-ass way. This is about six miles from there to 285. So let's say he went down this whole way. I know this whole area very well. Even back in the 80s, it's probably even more now, There was convenience stores, gas stations, restaurants, all up and down South Cobb Drive. And all of those are going to have pay phones, the Waffle House, a gas station. They're going to have dumpsters for boxes. But what does Wayne Williams do? He bypasses six miles full of gas stations, Waffle Houses, convenience stores, pay telephones and dumpsters he bypasses all of those to go down to this isolated area past the river down to Bolton Road to make a phone call almost more than a mile off highway 285 when he could have easily stopped at any place along this five mile route it doesn't make any fucking sense not any sense at all And again, another thing, don't you think, don't you really think that the police have, the FBI has enough knowledge and authority and power to go to that starving Marvin payphone and go to Southern Bell and say, hey, we want all the records of all the phone calls made there on the 21st and they always do it the day before and the day after 21st 22nd 23rd all the phone calls and then they go through and they look and is there any phone call made at 250 in the morning and that'll tell you real quick whether Wayne Williams is full of shit or not and the FBI is so thorough Okay, that I can guarantee you that for probably a mile down South Cobb Parkway, they went and stopped at every single convenience store and gas station and Waffle House and pulled the phone number off any pay phones that were there. You know, the little pay phones are going to have a a control number on the back there on the side for inventory. And they went to Southern Bell and said, hey, we want all the phone numbers for these days, these three days for those pay phones. And they're looking at those and see what phone calls are after midnight. And see if any of those line up with Cheryl Johnson's number or anywhere. And I guarantee you, if they found any phone numbers that were called after 2.30, they're interviewing those people Do you know Wayne Williams? Did you get a phone call from Wayne Williams? That's how thorough the FBI is. And I guarantee you, I mean, do you really, really think that the FBI wasn't pulling Wayne Williams' home phone number records and all the phone calls ever made in the last two years? Do you really think that they're not that thorough and didn't check all the phone numbers 
outgoing and ingoing because, you know, there's this really funny thing that the phone company keeps records of all the phone numbers coming in and all the phone numbers being dialed out. Isn't that, isn't that funny how that works? Don't you think the FBI had a list of all the victims' home phone numbers? And don't you think that they were cross-checking all 30 victims' home phone numbers with the phone numbers on Wayne Williams' home phone and his office phone on Shadow Lane? And don't you think that they found that Wayne Williams was in contact with some of the victims, either by calling them or they calling him. Don't you think they would be that thorough? Don't you think that the greatest law enforcement agency in the world could have the power to pull those records from Atlantic Bell and if they wouldn't give them to him or Southern Bell, if they wouldn't give them to him, they could go to a judge and get a warrant and get those fucking records? Don't you think the FBI could have done that? Don't you think they were smart enough to do that? We're not talking about a bunch of bungling fools like in the Atlanta police. Like, I don't know, ma'am. Maybe we can get some phone records from Southern Bell. You think You think maybe Wayne Williams may have called some of the victims at their home number? And maybe we may be, if we have their phone number and look at his phone records, we may be able to find... No, Bubba, they ain't going to have that. Well, you think he's stupid? You think he's going to call? And don't you think that the payphone all around Wayne Williams on his way to the going north, going south, going west within maybe a half a mile, don't you think the FBI would be smart enough to go check out those payphones and pull the records from those? and see if any of the victims were called from the payphones near Wayne Williams' house? Or are they just a bunch of bumbling idiots that Wayne Williams thinks that they are? See, none of this came out because they didn't have to enter that in, into the, the trial. So none of it came out. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. Do you really think the same FBI that could tell you all the phone numbers that the 9-11 terrorists called and were in contact with, even their international phone calls and the calls they made to the strip clubs and the calls they made to the um, air flight schools, you really think the same FBI wouldn't be pulling phone records from Wayne Williams' house and from Wayne Williams' victims? Don't you think they're looking for phone numbers like Wayne Williams' studio or Wayne Williams' house on the victims' phone numbers? Because if you look at it, a lot of these people left the house after receiving a phone call. So how it goes is Wayne Williams decides after he's auditioned this person, that's the person he's going to kill. Okay? So he calls them maybe a day or so before, maybe that day, and say, hey, um, Luby Getter, guess what? Congratulations. We've decided to use you in our Genesis group. We want to get together one last audition tape, and then we're going to start doing the record next week. What I need you to do is... I, you know, go down the street and meet me on the corner of Westview. I'll come by and pick you up. We'll go to the studio and get all that going. Don't you think that's sort of kind of how it happened? It wasn't like Wayne Williams was driving down the street and just saw some kid. You know, or it could have been that way. He could have known the areas they hung out and would drive by and say, hey, and give the same spiel. Come on, let's go to my studio and we'll cut a demo today. 
Get in the car. And don't you think that the FBI, even back in 1981, would have the capability to pull every fucking Cheryl Johnson name, driver's license, and birth certificate, because apparently she was from Memphis, Tennessee, okay, in Tennessee, in Georgia, in the entire fucking U.S., and don't you think that if they found any Cheryl Johnsons in Georgia or Tennessee, don't you think that the FBI would have sent out someone to interview them and say, hey, did you call Wayne Williams in Atlanta, Georgia about interviewing for a audition? Don't you think that probably would have happened? I mean, because what Wayne Williams and Chet Diggler and all the other fantasy players are asking us to do is suspend any logic in our brain and throw it out the window and believe in La La Land. To forget any brains that you might have in inherited or built up and just throw all that out the window and listen to his fantasy story. All right, so let's get back to fantasy. Who had scheduled an in-person interview with him that morning. He told the police he was out checking the address. That night, Wayne gave police an alleged phone number for Cheryl Johnson. But later when they tried to call the number, it didn't work. It didn't belong to anyone. But Wayne says the FBI called the wrong number. And the reason was his handwriting. The number was at 9347766. You'll see when you get my writing, I'm going to send you some samples of it. It was 434. My boys and my nines look alike because I closed the top of them. The FBI claimed Cheryl Johnson wasn't real, but Wayne Williams agrees. So, Cheryl Johnson, when did she originally call you and what did she say? Well, well she, she originally did not call me. She called my mother and my mother left a note. I talked to her the day before. And I, and I figured she was a prank call thing. We were doing public auditions. Uh, my music company, Nova Entertainment, some of the actors. That the ads we running on the radio, television stations, and the newspapers for, you know, in 1980. You know, the auditions were all over the radio and TV, and that's how she found out and got phone them. And like I said, we, we did probably, we took maybe about 800, 900 calls and probably did. We screened those down, me and my two assistants, and we probably did about 150 actual interviews and auditions out of that. I even tell the police, I said, the only reason I went out to check the address was because I felt it was a fake address. That's why I went out to check it in the first place. He said as a talent scout, he received hundreds of calls during that time. And that every so... So, did you hear what he just said? He says, originally, I didn't get the call. My mother got the call. Whereas in reclamation, he says he talked to her twice on the 20th, and then she called back on the 21st. So often he would get a fake caller. And Cheryl Johnson was likely one of them. And this is something to think about. How, why in the world, if somebody was killing, killing people, why would they be doing a public audition? That doesn't make sense. But why was Wayne out checking this address at two? Well, see, now he just exposed himself. Because that's how he's getting the victims in the car. He's already auditioned them. Okay. They know him. They trust him. And this is his way to to do his selection of what victims he wants and then he can call them later on and they easily get back in the car. See, the problem was people were always trying to figure out how's the guy getting these kids in the car? Well, there's that's the, that's the way. He's putting out this audition thing. He's screening them and then selecting the ones that he wants to kill. And then he's just calling them back. Two in the morning, when he was scheduled to meet with her just a few hours later. That never made sense to me. I mean, me being a 45-year-old man, if I'm out at two in the morning, if I'm not working and I'm looking for someone's house, <laughs> let's be honest, I know what I'm going to do at two in the morning. And it's not to talk record contracts. Did the FBI or the police ever find her in real life? No, 
and, 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 and I told him, you probably wasted your time because I'm not even sure that's her name. That was just the name that she gave. We were doing public auditions. A lot of people gave fake names and fake addresses. That was why. Again, whether it's a fake name or fake address or a fake phone number, don't you think that the police would pull Wayne Williams' phone records and look at every phone call that came in and went out that day? You know, I wouldn't be surprised if they sat there in interrogation with the list of the phone numbers from that day and says, okay, where is Cheryl Johnson's phone number on here? Because it says here at 4 o'clock on the 21st that nobody called you. And at 3 o'clock, nobody called you. And at 5 o'clock, nobody called you. So where on that day is Cheryl Johnson's phone number? Makes fucking sense to me, right? Pretty damn simple. I mean, you really, really, really think that the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, doesn't have the capability to go to Southern Bell, because that was the, the phone company back then, I remember, and say, we want all the phone records, in and outgoing phone calls, for this phone number. And if they say, well, uh, well we're going to need a, a, a warrant or a judge's order, fine. You don't think the FBI can get a goddamn search warrant for a phone number in a multi-murder investigation? You know, and then again, Wayne Williams doesn't get arrested till the 22nd. Surely Homer would have gotten a phone bill. Okay? And then he could show his phone bill and say, here, look, here's the phone, here's where she called. Or here's where we called them. But again, why would you talk to someone? Because depending on the year, in reclamation, he says he talked to her twice on the 22nd. The mother talked to her once on the 21st. And he talked to her once on the 21st. In the monster, he says his mother talked to her on the 21st. And he talked to her on the 21st. So whether it's two or four times, okay, why wouldn't you call this person back? If you're going to waste all your time going way the hell out there, why wouldn't you call this person first and say, look, I've looked at my map and I can't find this address. Makes sense to me. Anyway. What I think, okay, is that he knew someone at that address by a different name. That's why he knew the address. And then he made up a phone number and made up a name. Maybe it was a Cheryl Smith or Cheryl Williams, and he just switched the name. But don't you think that the police, the FBI, would have been smart enough to go to the manager besides asking for a Cheryl Johnson? Do you have anybody in your complex whose first name is Cheryl or last name is Johnson? And don't you think... That once they said, oh, yeah, we have a uh, um, Tina Johnson. Don't you think that the FBI would have gone to Tina Johnson's apartment and knocked on her door and said, hey, do you know a Cheryl Johnson? I wouldn't be surprised if the FBI went to every single apartment in that complex looking for a Cheryl, knocking on doors and looking for a Cheryl Johnson. That's how thorough and professional they are. Okay? And don't you think that the FBI, if they wanted to, could pull the phone number of every single person in that apartment complex and pull their phone records for that date and look on there and see if that anybody in that apartment complex called Wayne Williams' phone number on the 20th, the 19th, the 20th, the 21st, the 22nd, the 23rd. And again, where's Cheryl Johnson calling back saying, hey, 
you missed my appointment. She's already called him four times. But she doesn't call him back when he misses her appointment? It's all a hoax? He's, she's called him four times for a hoax, right? You know, when I was young, we used to just randomly call people from the phone book and say, Hey, your refrigerator's running. You better go catch it. Stupid, dumb shit, okay? Because nobody had the ability to see your number back in the 80s. They did, like, in the 90s, but not in the 80s. But <laughs> it just defies logic that someone would call him four times, okay, and give him a fake phone number and a fake address, but still call him four times? That don't make any sense. Why bother calling four times? It's just a teen prank or something? Is this what she's doing? Then why didn't she call back and say, Hey, you never showed up for my ad you never showed up at my address on Saturday or Friday. And he didn't try calling her back when he gets home? And he didn't go out there again, look at the address and talk to the apartment manager himself? Anyway, we'll keep going. I went out to scream. So I think all the, the hoopla over Cheryl Johnson is mean. You know, she was obviously a prank call. So maybe when he... A prank call that called him four times? Was out getting ready to meet someone and got lost. I don't know. Wayne likes to embellish things. I don't know why, but... It... I don't know when this came about, but I seem to remember before... Um, caller ID back in the 80s maybe the late 80s they had a, a code that you could call or you could, if someone called you and then you hang up and you pick up the phone again and you dial something like star well they came out with star 69 eventually that would give you the number but there was also another one before then that if you hit star 54 or whatever it is it would send that number to law enforcement or security in the police department and if they got enough of those numbers of that number they would either disconnect the phone number or send someone out the police to say hey we're getting a lot of prank calls from this damn number and we're gonna arrest someone anyone in the household I do remember that but I don't think that was in 1981 though again I think that was part of Wayne's downfall Regardless if he told the truth or not, I don't think the outcome would have been different simply because he was on the bridge. So, let's just think about that. If he lied about going all the way down to Bolton Road in the Starving Marvin and getting the boxes there and making the phone call and getting the dee -dee -dee, or she ain't here and then turning around and driving all the way back up that mile and the police never saw that happen they only saw him turn around at the liquor store right across the bridge and then he gets stopped and he gives the police a phone number and he gives the police a name and an address and all that's bogus if he lied about going to starving Marvin's he lied about Cheryl Johnson's phone number and her name and her address doesn't it stand to reason that he lied about throwing something off the bridge okay I mean is he just like okay no uh, well okay he lied about that he lied about this but no 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 he didn't stop and no 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 he didn't throw any trash and no 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 he didn't throw a body yeah he lied about the other things the the two bookends there making a phone call and this Cheryl Johnson and a whole story about that mess but no 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 the part about not stopping and the part about not throwing a body off the bridge he's got honest truth he's an angel you can believe him right I mean why even lie about that if you, you know that you didn't go all the way down to Bolton Road and the police got you on that you say, look, okay, yeah, I went to the liquor store. I thought it was Bolton Road, but I was mistaken. And then Cheryl Johnson. 
Why even mention Cheryl Johnson? I, he had to have a cover while he was while he was out there. And the only thing I can think that why pick an address way up South Cobb Drive there, way far away from where you're at, it's because you've been there before. You know somebody there. And don't you think that the police would have gone around and asked people in that apartment complex if they knew Wayne Williams? So Wayne Williams had been to that apartment complex before, so he knew that address. Okay? It had nothing to do with Cheryl Johnson. Maybe the girl's name was Cheryl Williams or Cheryl Smith or Cheryl McGillicuddy or whatever. Or it could have been a guy. Who knows? But he would have been better just to not even mention Cheryl Johnson or the phone number. All right. Do you regret being on the bridge that night? If you could go back and change it, would you not go that way? Well, hey, let me put it to you like this. I'm the type of person, okay, uh, I, I'm liable to change my mind at any given time. Everybody said, well, do you think it was a conspiracy when they ought to get you ahead of time? No, that was a conspiracy only after I became a suspect and the FBI got involved. Nobody knew I was going to take that route home, not even me, that night. That was a spur of the minute issue. The only thing I regret was, was going out, period, that night. You know, I should have just took my butt to bed and waited to in the morning. Do you think that if you didn't go out that night? And again, you got to think how lucky the FBI must have been that the one guy that they stopped on the last day of their stakeout, of their 28-day stakeout, at three hours before the stakeout ends, just happens they, they could have picked... R- randoms amounts of cars. Just say one car was coming by there every 10 minutes. Okay? And think about this. You got 12 hours in a day. 12 hours in their stakeout every night. Okay? And there's 60 minutes in an hour. That's 720 minutes every night. And let's just say it's really slow because the three officers said that cars were coming by every 5 or 10 minutes even at 3 in the morning. So at the slowest, you got 72 cars coming by. Okay? Times 28 days. There's over 2,000 cars at minimum in those 28 days. 2,000 cars. And out of those 2,000 cars, let's just do the statistics on that. 1 divided by 2,016 times 100 that's a point zero four nine six percent chance that they got the right car think about that Wayne Williams car was one of at least 2,000 cars in those 28 days passing over that bridge so that was one car which out of the total of the 2016 cars is point or zero point zero four nine six percent not even a half of a percent excuse me not even one percent not even a tenth of a percent a hundredth a one hundredth of a percent I mean that's like winning the fucking lottery you got better odds getting struck by lightning. Okay? So, out of those 2,000 cars, at least, you could probably even push it up to 3,000 cars. I'm sure it was busier during the day. They just happened to get lucky and pick the one car with the one guy who's had contact with witnesses, have seen him with some of the victims who happens to have four of the main, what, 12 fibers at his house. He's got 12 of them, but the four main ones, the green carpet, the the dog hair, German Shepherd dog hair, um, the violet acetate blanket, the yellow acetate blanket, that he used to wrap the the bodies up. All those are in his house. 
how lucky can they be? And on top of that, you got a police recruit just as he drives by for 28 days, they don't hear anything. They just have cars driving by. But just when Wayne Williams drives by, the police recruit hears a body or hears something hit the river. And not only are they lucky with that, two days later they find a body downstream from the same position. How lucky can you get? I mean, you couldn't coordinate that, you know, it'd be impossible. But hey, the FBI is professionals. When they're gonna when they're gonna frame somebody, they're gonna do a damn good job, you know? They're gonna make sure that they've gone into Wayne Williams' house for two two years prior and pulled fibers from his green carpet and they've pulled fibers from his violet acetate blanket and they've pulled fibers from his or hairs from his dog and they've pulled fibers from that yellow blanket he used to wrap the bodies after he killed the people they're so thorough they pulled enough of that but why not why only put it like you know green acetate carpet fibers on 10 bodies why not put it on all 30 and then the violet acetate is on like what another 10 bodies why not put it on all 30 and the yellow acetate is on say another eight bodies why not put it on all 30 and the dog hairs are on like 12 victims why not put it on all 30 drive it home make it real make it a slam dunk and so what they the FBI would have done they would have got those things back in what out of you know they found this sucker for some unknown reason they found this sucker back in July of 1979 okay and the Ku Klux Klan is killing all these people and so the the racist cops in the police department and the FBI they've already picked out Wayne Williams and they've got all these fibers and they're going around as the Ku Klux Klan is trying to start a race war and they're planting these fibers on the body before Larry Peterson can get there. And, and they're putting them inside the mud that was found on Nathaniel Cater's hair that coated his hair and sealed in the fibers. They're that good that they can put those fibers underneath the mud in his hair. Okay? And same thing with Jimmy Ray Payne. And same thing with, you know, the, some of the other victims found in the rivers. They're that good because they're professional racist FBI, right? And they do that for two years. And finally, they decide, okay, we're, we're going to let this come to an end because apparently the race war is not starting. So let's just end this and we'll blame it on this black guy that we chose two years before. And we're just going to somehow figure it out that he's going to be, you know, we're going to be lucky and have our guys all over every bridge and eventually he's going to drive by one of these bridges somehow. Think how lucky the FBI must be, right? To set all that up and frame Wayne Williams so there wouldn't be a race war. But if you, it kind of blows the story because if you want a race war and you have racist cops in the police department and in the FBI, well, wouldn't you want it to be a white guy that gets caught? Why wouldn't they frame a white guy instead? And then when the white guy gets caught, all these supposedly race riots break out and this big race war occurs. Why frame a black guy? Why not frame a white guy? Then you're guaranteed of a race war, right? Right? Oh, maybe, maybe the FBI is not as smart as we thought. Maybe they didn't think that one through. You see how ridiculous this is? You see how crazy when I hear these people defending Wayne Williams, how crazy talk that is and the logic? They haven't thought it through. It's what they believe, regardless of the evidence, regardless of the documents, regardless of anything that they have no evidence to prove. It's what they believe happened, what they want to believe happened. 
And you can't live your life believing the way things are, believing things happen. I mean, shit. There was a movie about a guy who believed he could fly. All he needed to do was glue enough damn fucking feathers on his arms and his back. And he was crazy. And then one day he jumped off a building and he found out reality really fucking quick. When he fell and smashed into the pavement ten floors below. And reality cracked open his skull. But by then it was too late. And the same thing is happening with these people that for 20 or 30 or 40 years believe Wayne Williams was set up by racist cops. Well, again, if they're trying to start a fucking race war, why not frame a white guy? Because then they can have their race war. Why frame Wayne Williams? Because then it just ends. It's a black guy. There's no race war. See, that's what I'm talking about. If you talk to these people and push through all their arguments and show me the evidence and let's talk about exactly what you're talking about and push it out and think about it it all falls apart all right that you would not be in jail right now absolutely no question on that if they had to ask the same question that you're asking me right now i wouldn't be sitting here, bottom line living in Fort Hood, Texas. My dad was military. You know, even then that story was national news about these black kids being murdered in Atlanta. I remember my mom to this day telling me not to go outside, you know, past dark, even in Fort Hood, Texas, in Killeen, because they were killing these little kids. Wayne Williams got arrested and got convicted, and that was pretty much it. And supposedly the murder stopped, and that's what I took it for, you know, as a small child. You know, it's just you trust what the police say, you trust what the courts say, and that, that was pretty much it. You know, but as I got older, uh, especially when I became a police officer, and you see how you got these people that weren't adults, weren't 14, my age, or older. They're all children, and then they don't remember. They don't know, okay? They don't remember seeing Wayne Williams on the TV set. They don't remember the nightly terror. These are ignorant people talking, just like Payne, just like this policeman officer and a private investigator, and I realized this keyword called evidence, then my mindset started changing about the entire case. First, we can't say that the child murders were solved because Wayne was convicted of killing Nathaniel Cater and uh, Jimmy Ray Payne, which were adults. So we still have all of these child murders basically unsolved because you can't say it's solved if you only convicted him of killing two people. Wayne's a very intelligent guy. And again, I totally agree with that. This is why we need to go and sue the city and force them to either have a truth commission or have another trial for the other 28 victims and close the books on this have some kind of closure because they just left it wide open for all the crazies to come out and say he didn't do it I, I think Wayne's downfall back then was he embellished a lot Wayne wanted to be the center of attention he was calling his own press conferences uh, which just made him a bigger target in the media, right? You know, a lot of people that were innocent of this would have just said, I had nothing to do with it, and that's it. But I'm convinced it was something totally different that happened. Williams bluntly stated the police version of the now famous bridge incident was wrong, a lie. He claimed he wasn't driving slow, that he didn't turn around in a parking lot next to the bridge, that he did not throw anything into the river. The state contends that loud splash was the body of Nathaniel Cater hitting the water. Although prosecutors had most of the pieces that night in May, it still lacked. So that news report just said that Wayne Williams said it was a lie that he turned around in the parking lot right after the bridge, but yet we've got a special agent of the FBI, a police recruit, and a patr police patrolman all giving individual statements saying exactly the same thing. So think about it. The FBI agents in the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the special agent, completely different law enforcement agency his boss his pay his training completely different than the Atlanta patrolman the Atlanta patrolman is in the Atlanta Police Department he's paid by the taxpayers of Atlanta his boss is Lee Brown and the mayor completely different training 
in the police academy. Okay? And then you got the police recruit. He's not even a policeman yet. Do you think he's going to risk his future that he's going to a police academy and so he's going to get together with a FBI agent and with a Atlanta policeman and lie? I mean, are we producing this kind of police recruits that they're automatically going to lie and cover everyone's ass? And when do they have time to get together? Because the special agent left the scene and went and chased down Wayne Williams. He didn't get together with the patrolman and say, or with the recruit and say, hey, now we're going to say this when you put do your statement, okay? And the patrolman took off after Wayne Williams also. And he didn't get together with the police recruit and say, okay, now, when the FBI, and you fill out your report, and the FBI questions you, we're going to say this, that Wayne Williams stopped, you know, and then re- restarted his car and then went down to the liquor store and turned around. Okay, wink, wink, nod, nudge, nudge. They didn't have time to do that. So that that's crazy talk, again, of people who don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Fact, the essential part of the puzzle. Someone actually seen Williams' car stopped on the bridge, or better yet, the suspect throwing a body from the structure. Could be something, could be nothing. Could have been a bird taking off. It could have been a beaver. Could have been anything. You got police down there with flashlights immediately, and they see nothing? So that would suggest that Daniel Cater's body, as soon as it hit the water, just floated out of sight, like a speedboat. Splash. You shine your lights. No, I don't see anything. Why not? If it floated down the river and you found it two days later, why wouldn't you see it as it's floating down the river right after? And this guy was a policeman, and he doesn't know about the breakdown of the body and how it produces gases that cause the body to float. How? What? What? Where did this guy get his uh, badge from? Was it from a cereal box? Everybody knows that when a body dies or a person dies, that the gases build up underneath the skin, okay, and cause the body to inflate. We've seen this when they show the bodies in, you know, those photos from Uh, Jonestown how bloated the bodies were and that's because the gas is built up underneath the skin eventually they break the skin the gases escape the body deteriorates so when you're dropping the body off the bridge and it goes into the water it's going to sink especially when you have a really muddy red clay muddy river like the Chattahoochee it's going to be impossible to find anything, okay? And I've been in the Chattahoochee many, many times, and you can't even, you know, you get in the water in the Chattahoochee, you can't even see your knees, much less your waist, okay? Much less a body that sunk down, you know, to the bottom of the river there. And then as the, the body deteriorates, the gases build up, the body floats and floats underneath. Sometimes it won't even float at the top. It's not a life preserver. It'll float halfway up the river, halfway or just below the surface. And then that's when they find it. So, and you saw how wide that river was and how long that river was. You know, a hundred yards across, a couple of miles long. At night, it doesn't matter if you have flashlights. It's going to be really, really hard to find a body. Okay, we'll keep going, and then we'll we'll finish this up. I don't don't think Wayne Williams talks anymore after this. If you heard the splash and you thought it was a body, why didn't you send divers down there immediately? Dr. Blackwelder was there. Again, it's very, very murky water at 3 in the morning. There was a swift current. It's going to be really, really hard to get divers if you got if you call made the call immediately 
for divers, it could be hours, two, three hours for divers show up. I'm sure they did have divers. Matter of fact, I'm certain of it. During the trial, so I asked him what he knew about the splash. The cadet that was under the bridge heard a splash, and his head flashlights and all that. He shined around, but they never saw anything. So they don't. They said it could have been a beaver because there were beavers in that river. It could have been a beaver slapping its tail on the water, or it could have been a body that was thrown off the bridge into the water. But he heard a splash. I asked Popcorn with the FBI, what was his take? Two cadets under the bridge, two regular officers in chase cars. They were in tents underneath the bridge, and the guy that heard the splash had been a high school swimmer, and he knew what the sound of a body hitting the water, and he said, that's a body hitting the water. That was a splat. As you know, if you jump off a diving board and you spread eagle and hit the water, you splat, and that's what he heard. And they looked, you know, to see what was in the water, and they never could see anything floating in the water. And then they brought a hydrologist in from the Corps of Engineers, and, and somebody testified there were, a lot of, there were a lot of beavers in the river. If he pops its tail in the water, it'll make a splat. And here's another thing. If you've been sitting under that bridge for 28 days, don't you think he's going to know every fucking sound, whether it's a beaver or a rock rolling into the river? Don't you think he got kind of an idea of what all the sounds are like by, like, the 28th day? And so when you take a big body and throw it in the river, it's going to make a very loud sound. It's going to be unlike anything he's heard the first, the 28 days prior. All right, we're going to stop here, and um, we'll pick this up next time. All right, take care.